Welcome to Shady Jay's Garage. Together, we'll keep history on the road. Today, we're gonna to be diving into a problem that happens a lot in a lot of the older drum bake vehicles that have been around for a while, which is the wheel brake cylinders tend to go bad, especially where the rubber mountings are at the end, and starts to leak brake fluid, which can be a very dangerous situation. So first, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to diagnose that, and then we'll dive into it. If you're new to my videos, uh, go to the bottom if there's a specific part that you're stuck on, or if there's anything you'd like to see as far as which tools or parts to pick up, I'll have all that information at the bottom. And as always, please like and subscribe. Now, first and foremost, when it comes to diagnosing issues with a wheel brake cylinder, one of the first things that you might notice is a lot of play suddenly in the brake pedal that you didn't have before. So when that happens, that's usually a sign of either air in the lines or loss of pressure in the lines. So the first thing you want to do is actually look under the vehicle and see if you can determine that there is in fact a brake fluid leak at any of the points or at the master cylinder. Now you're going to need a 3 ton floor jack to lift the truck. As well you'll need 6 or 12 ton jack stands to place it on and wheel chocks. You're also going to want a 3 8 or half inch socket set with sockets ranging from 19 millimeters and below. And you'll also want a 140 foot pound of torque torque wrench. And if you're using a 14 bolt rear end with a floating axle, you'll want a spindle nut socket as well as a, a magnet tool. Additionally, it's helpful to have picks and it's also helpful to have brake cleaner and your favorite penetrating oil. It's also good to have a brake bleeding set that includes wrenches pictured here and linked below if you're working on this by yourself. And lastly, safety goggles and gloves are always important. Now some optional tools that I really recommend to help you out is either a battery powered or air compressor powered impact wrench uh, to speed things up. As well, since you're taking the drum brake off, it's good to either rent from your local auto parts store or buy a digital drum brake caliper. And the associated mechanical gauge will allow you to size your shoes for your drum brake when you put it back on. And this will speed time on reassembly. Now for parts for this installation, you really just need the wheel brake cylinder for most applications and the C20's version is linked below. You're also gonna want a decent sized bottle of DOT3 brake fluid for the process. And if you do have the 14 bolt rear end, you'll want the gasket to replace as well. Now safety never takes a holiday. So you're gonna wanna start by chalking both of your front wheels at the front before lifting the truck at all. Now, if you are using a 14 bolt rear end, you can't place this in part because you'll need to spin the wheels. But if it isn't a 14 bolt rear end, go ahead and place it in park. Then you're gonna go ahead and take your floor jack and jack up from the rear differential carefully until you can get the height necessary to slide your six or 12 ton jack stands directly under the axle. This will allow you to then slowly lower the axles and ensure that they seat on the jack stands before you proceed to take the wheel off on the side that you have to service. Once it's seated, you're ready to begin. The next step is to go ahead and use your impact ratchet, or if you're doing it by hand, go ahead and remove all the lug nuts on the side that you want to service. But for safety, remember to keep the opposite side wheel on at all times during this procedure, just in case you have a failure of the jack stand. Once the lug nuts are off, go ahead and move everything out of the way and roll the wheel out of the way as well. Now, if you're servicing a C10 or most Chevy and GM cars, you can probably go ahead and massage the drum brake off now with a rubber mallet. But if you have a 14 bolt rear end like me, go ahead and use your penetrating oil on the nuts that secure the axle flange to the wheel hub. And go ahead and let it sit to save you some time. Then you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and take that off. Now it's safe to go ahead and gently take it off with an impact ratchet, but you can also take these off by hand, especially if you've allowed them enough time to soak in penetrating oil before attempting to remove them. Once you have all the axle flange bolts off of the wheel hub, you can go ahead and use a BFH to tap as you pull on the half axle. Once it separates from the rear differential, grab some shop towels or any sort of non-pilling cloth in order to protect your hands as you pull it out. Ensure that your catch pan is also below in case any fluid from the rear differential drips out. Once removed, go ahead and set somewhere in the garage ensuring that you have one of the shop rags covering the splines on the end of the axle to prevent any damage or debris being picked up. Next, you're gonna to wanna to use either a pick set or screwdriver to very carefully remove the retaining ring that holds the locking block in side the spindle nut. Once you've got it out, set it aside carefully and then you can use picks, but the easiest solution is to use a pointing shop magnet 
uh, to just simply pull the locking block out using the magnet power. Once that's removed, now you can get your spindle nut socket out and you may have to modify it on some of the older 14 volt rear ends to ensure that the teeth actually made up properly with the shape of the teeth inserts on the spindle nut. But once you've ensured that that works, you should be able to spin it out either by hand or with just a little bit of pressure on a half inch socket. The key here is to avoid cross threading at all or putting too much debris in it by just gently and evenly continuing to back it out until it's pretty much on the edge of the teeth. Once that's done, you can go ahead and pry it off with your fingers the rest of the way. Now that the spindle nut socket is removed, it's time to take the drum brake off. Now if your wheel cylinder was broken, it's very likely that the shoes are not putting any pressure on the drum any longer. But if for some reason they were stuck against the drum, instead of pulling it off as easy as you saw me do here, you should be able to use a BFH to massage it off with a little bit of persuasion. Now that the drum is off, you're going to want to put a mask and safety goggles on and then come back and soak the brakes and all of the components very liberally with brake cleaner. It's very likely if your wheel cylinder broke that you've built up a ton of gunk all around the brakes. Then you're going to want to come back with shop towels and rags and just be very patient because there will be a lot of buildup, especially if your wheel brake cylinder is broken, and get all of that gunk off of the shoe facing and as much as possible from the inside of the brake backing as well. Once you're satisfied with the cleaning of the actual brakes, you'll need to go to the drum. Same principle applies with mask and safety goggles on. Make sure to spray down the inside of the drum. This tends to have a little bit more powder from the brakes and ensure that you then come back and clean it very carefully with a paper towel or shop rag in order to get everything off of the braking surface as possible and any large chunks off of the rest of the drum. Once your drum is clean, now is the perfect time to take your digital brake caliper set and take measurements. On the front plate of the drum, there will actually be a stamped number which will indicate the max diameter of tolerance that the brake drum is allowed to achieve. So you'll want to measure at multiple angles as well as change the depth at which you measure on the braking surface. And for one, make sure that you have not exceeded or gotten too close to that max diameter, but also ensure that you don't see large variations between the different points that you measure. The bolts that hold the wheel caliper in, as well as the nut that holds the brake line in, are notoriously prone to fail. So it's always a good idea to soak them in penetrating oil before you attempt to break them free in order to reduce the risk of failure and needing to extract any of those points. Next, with a small wrench, you'll want to try to remove the brake line next. Ensure that it doesn't twist too much and brace it if necessary. Also, be warned that these old brake lines, especially if original, are prone to braking, as you will see here. If it does break like mine does in this video, not to worry. All of your local auto parts stores will actually have brake lines that you can install. So just move it out of the way and continue to proceed. Ensure that you place a rag over it if it is dripping any of your fluids. Next, use your socket wrench to ensure that you can break free both of the bolts that secure the wheel brake cylinder to the actual drum brake backing. Once you've broken them free, just go ahead and continue to back them out until you can remove both bolts. Once the bolts are removed, you can now come back to the front of the brake and using a screwdriver, or pick, just push in the pistons that come out of either side of the wheel cylinder as there's no longer brake fluid pressure behind it. Once you push both in, you should be able to very easily pull the wheel brake cylinder out through the front. Now, with everything removed, it's time to clean up all the parts and prepare for installation of the new wheel brake cylinder. Go through all of the bolts that you removed and clean them up with clean shop rags or even using brake cleaner like I did, ensuring that you get all of the gunk and debris which is typically built up on those when you've had a wheel brake cylinder failure as the brake fluid that's leaking tends to mix with the dust that comes off of the shoe brakes. Once you've properly cleaned all of the mounting components, then you'll be ready to start prepping the wheel brake cylinder for reinstallation.
Now a quick and easy step to reduce a little bit of the air in the lines that you're going to have to deal with after installation is to use a paper funnel or other very small funnel and actually pour just a little bit of brake fluid into the new wheel brake cylinder prior to installation. It won't take much at all to fill it, so don't pour too much because you're going to spill all over the place. But just by pouring this little bit in, it will go back through the brake lines when you reinstall. If you broke a brake line like me, make sure you've fed it through the other side of the brake backing. If not, the first step is to spin your wheel brake cylinder gently on to the brake line before installation. That way, as you push it back and start to place the pistons back in, it will push the brake fluid that you've already fed into it into that line. Because the master cylinder is not engaged, you'll be able to depress the pistons enough to place the pistons back on the appropriate point of the shoes. Now, doing this might require some additional tools to manipulate it, so this is also a good point to either use a screwdriver or a pick as necessary in order to ensure that you get the pistons placed back correctly onto the shoes. Continue to negotiate as much as possible, and once you get them set about where you want, the wheel brake cylinder may not line up completely straight yet, and that's all right. Some aftermarket wheel cylinders are actually shaped on the back side so that they snap into place on the actual backing. If that's not the case for your particular model, that's all right. Just to make sure that you align the holes to the back side so that you can actually take the bolt and start it by hand on one side and then ensure you align the other side and start it by hand as well. So once you have them started, just go ahead and continue to push them on by finger and get them as tight as possible. Once they are tight, now you can come back with a socket wrench and just ensure they're good and tight. There's no need to crank on any of these components. Once you've secured the wheel brake cylinder to the drum brake backing, now you can go ahead and get your wrench back out and secure the brake line the rest of the way since you've already started it. Again, once it starts to get snug at the end, don't crank on it. It doesn't take much pressure to get it properly secured. Now, if you had to replace your brake line like I did, it would have been separated at typically a splitting unit that's right above the rear differential, which you see here. So before aligning or bending too much of your new brake line, ensure that you bend it up so that you can actually secure it to that joint. Once it's secured there, again, don't over tighten. Now you can go ahead and firmly, but uh, not too aggressively, bend your new brake line to match the old angles and routing of the brake line that you removed. There's typically hangers and different things that it will snap into. In this case, this line's a little bit long, but none of the angles are too sharp to create a problem. With the new wheel brake cylinder secured, now you're gonna wanna go ahead and prepped for reinstallation of the drum. It's always a good idea to re-clean with brake cleaner your pads just in case you've touched them or brushed against them and gotten any oil on them at all. Once you've cleaned the shoes, you're going to want to repeat the same procedure of one last second cleaning of the drum before reinstallation. Once you've cleaned the drum, you can go ahead and grab the drum and prepare to remount the drum itself. If you have automatic adjusting brakes, you can rely on that, but this would also be a good time to use your brake measurement tool to ensure that the shoes have been adjusted out far enough for your drum. Now, if you have the 14 bolt rear end, you're going to need to now start to get the wheel hub properly mounted instead of just going straight to putting your tire back on. So in this case, you're going to start with a spindle nut. Uh, very gently spin it back on with a spindle nut socket. And once you get it started, put some pressure against the drum to seat it as best as possible. As you're able to spin it on, you're going to get it as tight as possible with hand using the spindle nut socket, but not using a wrench yet. Now, the next step is much easier if you have someone else to actually help spin the wheel hub for you. But if you have to do it by yourself, you're going to spin it by hand the best you can while you use a torque wrench to start working the spindle nut towards 50 foot-pounds of torque. All that you're really going to want to do 
is move it up towards 50 foot-pounds of torque, spin it, and repeat the process. Once you've hit 50 foot-pounds of torque, it's good to spin it a few more times and, and continue to check that it is still at 50 foot-pounds after a few revolutions. This will ensure that the spindle nut is properly seated against the bearing and ensures that the wheel hub in total is properly seated as well. Once you've set it to 50 foot-pounds of torque, you'll actually then back it off slightly and push it back to 35 foot-pounds of torque. Now that you're set at 35 foot-pounds of torque, the next step is to ensure that the hole actually lines up with the slot on the wheel hub so that you can place the locking pin back in place. You can loosen up to a quarter turn or tighten slightly in order to ensure that the holes line up. Once you've lined up the hole in the spindle nut socket and the wheel hub, you can now take the locking pin and slide it into the slot. Once secure and flush, the next step is to grab the retaining ring and gently place it around the first set of threads. You don't want to bend it significantly placing it in, but once you get it across the first set of threads, you can slowly walk it back one thread at a time until it's flush. Ensure that the tooth on the retaining pin is properly lined up back in front of the locking pin to keep pressure on it so that it doesn't slide forward. With the wheel hub properly loaded and secured, you can now grab your half axle. Make sure you slip the new gasket over it and keep it towards the end. Slide the spline in end, and then as it gets towards the rear differential, you'll have to wiggle it a little bit left and right until the splines actually seat into the rear differential appropriately. Once that happens, you'll now be able to start all of the bolts to re-secure the axle flange by hand. As you begin to tighten these bolts, especially when you begin to use your half inch socket set in order to get your initial tightness, you want to continue the traditional star, star pattern to ensure that you seat the gasket properly when you tighten it against the wheel hub. After you've used your socket wrench to tighten this down in a star pattern as best you can just using the socket wrench, you're then going to need to prepare to torque it. Now it's important to note that when torquing these bolts, you're going to want to work your way up to the 115 foot-pound torque spec in kind of an incremental step, continuing in the star pattern, working from about 65 foot-pounds of torque up to 115 in 15 to 20 foot-pound of torque intervals. Also, it's important to note that as you work your way up in torque, because you had to leave your vehicle in neutral so that the wheels could spin, you're not going to be able to hold the torque back on your own. So you're going to go back and actually remove the jack stands after lifting the rear differential slightly off the jack stands and then lower it back just enough so that the opposite side wheel is touching the ground and presiding resistance. Once that resistance is in place, then you'll be able to go back and ensure proper torque on all of the bolts. Also, ensure that you've double checked the torque on the bolts at least twice all the way around at the 115 foot-pound of torque or 136 foot-pound of torque for the newer 14 volt rear ends as indicated in your manual. Once that's complete, you'll be able to roll your wheel back over to this lower point, place the wheel back on, and make sure you always start your lug nuts by hand and then tighten them down in a star pattern using either your impact socket wrench or using your handheld socket wrenches. Whenever using impacts, especially if you have some cheaper equipment, it's always a good idea that after you lower the wheel fully back on the ground is to grab your torque wrench and double check that you have done 120 foot-pounds of torque on those lug nuts before you drive around. And then again, before you take off, it's always a good idea uh, drive it around the block a few times and ensure that afterwards you are still at that 120 foot-pounds of torque per lug nut. But now it's time to bleed the brakes. The first thing you're going to want to do is open the hood and ensure the cap for your master cylinder is open. This way you can ensure that you don't run out of fluid during the process. 
Remember that you're going to need to bleed the brakes, starting with the brake farthest away from the master cylinder and working your way forward, which means you'll start with the rear right, then the rear left, then the front right, and then finally the front left. Now as you do the bleeding procedure, you're going to want to use your brake bleeding kit and build up approximately 20 to 50 PSI, depending on your kit, against the bleeding nozzle before you crack it loose. Once the PSI is in place, you'll then crack loose the bleeding nozzle and the vacuum pressure will do the rest. Once your vacuum gauge indicates 4 or 5 PSI left, make sure to then close off the brake bleeding valve and go ahead and build your PSI back up. It should take about 5 or 6 times per side to remove all the air. Once that's done in proper sequence, you'll be ready to get back on the road with your piece of history. Thanks for joining us here at Shady J's Garage. I hope this video is helpful and have a safe and enjoyable day. Please like and subscribe if you found this beneficial and let us know what else we can do to show you how to keep history on the road. Thank you.